So tonight, we have the esteemed <laughs> <laughs> Rick Morgan, and I'm gonna have to look, W4EK, uh, doing a presentation on antennas, and he's gonna uh, just blow you away. So anyway, introduce yourself, tell us what you've done, and kick it off. Well, Rick, W4EK, as uh, <laughs> Lynn, Lynn alluded to, uh, as far as amateur radio, as far as over the holidays, uh, did absolutely nothing but work on a presentation. And but thank you. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> hopefully it's well worthwhile and you guys will get us something out of it. Uh, I live, we live uh, just across the line in Cherokee County over at Freehome is where I live at. And I'm um, uh, used to climb the, uh, used to climb the tower over here in Fasani Mountain back when I wasn't, uh, didn't have this hair color and have this much weight on me. But uh, nowadays I avoid climbing like the plague because it probably wouldn't be good for my health. So with that, let's, uh, let's get going. Then of course I'm calling this Antennas 099. It's the remedial course. Yeah. It's basically for guys that haven't done an antenna before, want to make an antenna, maybe want to get into this, and try to do your own. One of the best things, one of the great feelings that I always had was when somebody asked what kind of antenna I'm running, I'm saying, it's one I made myself, you know. Not only just a little dipole, but I've made beam antennas and quads and we've done a lot of different things. Let's see, it. Let's see if this mouse actually works. Yes. So a little bit about me, about my qualifications, so to speak. Uh, I've been licensed since 1977. I was first licensed as WD4ABO, later changed it to W4ABO and realized if I was going to do that, why not go ahead and get my extra? So I went ahead and got an extra license. I worked for a company, I worked for several places, but uh, for the last 40 years I've worked at a company that was known as Electromagnetic Sciences and we were purchased by Honeywell in 2011. I'm known as a mechanical designer. I'm not an RF engineer. Nowhere close to it. I deal with mechanical things. And this is the type of equipment that we designed. It's basically microwave radio equipment. And if you notice, you know, these are, these guys are switches, and here's a whole system, phase shifter, and it's kind of radar, satellite antenna, satellite power, and uh, these sort of things. This is what I do all day for a living, is make drawings of equipment like you see here. This is actually an isolator from the company that I work for. I probably worked on it. <laughs> but, but we're talking, these frequencies go from three gigahertz up to, in fact somebody called me today about a project that we did a while back that was a 90 gigahertz switch. Mm -hmm. I call that WR small because the darn switch is about half inch. It's not very big. Okay. Oh, man, I'm not going to get this right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Antennas. Here are some large antennas on the opposite side of the stuff that I work on. Someone made a, uh, made a dream here. This is a, an 80 meter quad. I don't know if anybody knows what a quad antenna is, but that's a full wavelength. That is a large antenna. I don't know if they ever built it or not. I found the plans and I thought, this is neat. <laughs> This one they actually did build. I'm not sure if this is ON8H or if this is uh, one, of, one of the antennas over in the Netherlands. This is a five element Yagi, full size for 80 meters. Notice that the boom is made out of tower sections. This is a big antenna. But all of your rules for antennas can be summed up pretty much in one statement, and that's the statement here. The bigger they are, the higher they are, the better they are. Pretty much sums up antennas. But, let's see if this, if they stayed up, they weren't big enough or high enough. <laughs> There's a three element 80 meter, and uh, this is what happened to it. So what can we say about this antenna, guys? Doesn't work. No, it was big enough and high enough, right? <laughs> Just not strong enough. Well, it's, uh, it was big enough or high enough because it didn't stay up. A few fun facts about 
the RF that you want to come out of your antenna. I guess in free space and in a perfect vacuum, your RF is traveling at the speed of light. That means when you call, when you throw your call sign out on the repeater, what you transmit is going to reach the moon in about 1.27 seconds. Mars, it'll take between 4.3 and 21 minutes, depending upon where its orbit is. And the same thing can be said for Jupiter. It's about 33 minutes, plus or minus. It can be longer or shorter for your antenna, for your signal to actually reach there. Our closest star, Alpha Centauri, is about 4.4 light years away. It takes 4.4 light years to get a signal there, and 4.4 years to get it back. Uh, the star Vega is about 30 light years away, and Pollux is about 40 light years away. So, you'd be waiting a long time to get an answer to your CQ from Pollux. <laughs> Hence, our little cartoon here. Marconi's first radio broadcast was about 125 years ago. The width of the Milky Way is measured in light years is 100,000. So in uh, 99,875 years, Marconi's signal will reach the other side of our galaxy. Hmm. And I guess the last, our, our fastest spacecraft, the Parker Solar Probe, which set a record at 364,660 miles per hour. It's the fastest spacecraft that, that there is. It would take 8,000, 269 years to reach Alpha Centauri. Voyager 1 and 2, which has left our solar system and is now in interstellar space, considered interstellar space, uh, would take 75,000 years to get there. So, a little bit about your signals and where they're at. So you can think about when I was first licensed and first picked up the microphone, you can figure out how far your signal's been. Not that far. <laughs> and in some cases, that's a good thing, right? All right, let's talk about what that RF signal actually is. And if you got questions, let us know. We'll try to fill them shortly and try to fill, I'll have a space at the end of this for more. But <coughs> let's talk about a wavelength. If you'll notice, my little chart here is from zero to 360 degrees. That's a full wavelength. And if you notice what a wavelength is, it's, it's measured in degrees. So a wavelength is basically a circle where you introduce time. So, and this is called one cycle per second, or one hertz, of course. Okay, we're going to divide this up into a quarter wavelength. And this, this has length to it, as illustrated here. A half wavelength, which is 180 degrees, or a full wavelength, which is a 360. Most of your dipole antennas are figured at 234 divided by the frequency in megahertz will give you the distance in feet. So an 80 meter, one quarter wavelength, it's going to be about 66.86 feet per leg. So your total antenna is going to be 130 something feet. This is for a standard quarter wave dipole. 10 meters, it's about 8.21 feet, so that's going to give you about uh, 16 and a half feet for a, a half wave dipole. Two meters is 1.6 feet, so you're about 3.2. The WSB, I don't know if you've ever seen the WSB tower on Williams Road in the Tucker, you can see it right off of 285. It's huge. A quarter wave for the WSB antenna tower is 312 feet. I think that thing's a half wave. That means it's over 600 feet. I think it is. I'm not real sure. Everybody knows. Ch chime in. Yeah, somebody, somebody quick look it up right quick and let us know. So, the wavelength is longer, of course, as you go lower in frequency, shorter as you go higher, as illustrated. This little, this little animation is to show how over a half wave 
your half-life dipole, this is your current versus voltage distribution. They are not, they're, they're, they are opposite one another. At a high voltage point, you got a low current point. At a low current point, you got a high voltage point. And this is the way the wave propagates off the antenna. Okay. And this is considered a totally balanced design. And what I mean by balanced design, it's equal. The left side of the antenna, the right side of the antenna, these are equal. The feed line is all equal. And this becomes important as we, as we get a little further in this presentation. Can you answer your question? It's a 5 eighths wave. Oh, okay, so it's a little bit higher than 6. degrees. Yeah. 5 eighths. I know it's a, it's a tall one. You can see it for a while. So let's get into our antenna physics. This is what some of you guys are thinking about right now. Half-wave dipole, 468 eight feet, divided by the frequency in megahertz, or 234 feet for a quarter-wave leg. This is typically somebody's first antenna that we've all built. And if you notice, I say it's got a 75 ohm coax cable. We've got two one quarter wavelength legs, insulators, rope. Okay. And when you, when you make one of these things, when you do this figure, always add additional space on your wire. Why do you want to do that? Because you're going to need to make loops. So always add a couple extra feet to do that. And tuning. A halfway dipole feed point, and this is, this is where we get to making your radio happy, is about 70 to 80 ohms when it's in a flat top configuration like this. Now, if I do, if I pull these legs down into an inverted V configuration, guess what happens? the impedance drops to around 50 ohms, believe it or not. So, 75 ohm coax cable, I'll go into that a little bit later, you can match your 50 ohm transmitter to this by using a quarter wavelength matching section. I got a question. Question is. So you say if you, if you do a V, mm -hmm. out of that wire, mm -hmm. you get it down to 50 ohms. How is that determined? Is it determined? Yes. Oh. How do you measure that? Can I just go out to Home Depot and get a DMM and? Uh, <laughs> I'll get. I'll get. It, I'll get in. I'll get in. No, I'll get into. Uh, I'll get into that. Uh, how you can measure that? One way is get you a, a uh, antenna analyzer, and it will give you the information. There's another way. I mean, and that's basically if you know your antenna is resonant. A standing way, a difference of that much is going to give you about a 1.3 to 1 or 1.4 to 1 standing wave ratio at its right. at its uh, uh, resonant point. So that that's one way to understand that your impedance is a little bit off from 50 ohms. Your your radio is designed for a 50 ohm load. Right. You use coax that's 50 ohms. Yeah. Antennas can be 75 ohms, as illustrated here. So you're, going, you're not going to get your standing wave down to a perfect one-to-one -one unless it sees 50 ohms. So, so good not necessarily, no. Not necessarily. I mean, the equal impedance, having an impedance of 50 ohms is the good thing. Less, 30 ohms, same problem. More? Same problem. It's that your impedance is off, so your standing wave is going to be elevated. Okay, a folded dipole would be around 300 ohms, and folded dipole basically is a full wavelength. And then uh, a half wave radiator can have an impedance of 900 ohms. So that's the reason you stick with that quarter wavelength. You're looking for that 50 ohm load. So again, what are we looking for? Well, here's an illustration. Now this is, this is basically pulled off of uh, a uh, antenna analyst program, but you can make your own chart and run your own curve. 
most of your modern HF transceivers today have a standing wave and a stevr meter built in so you can check to see what your standing wave is <laughs> but you're going to want to run some different points and find where your resonant point is this one's down about 705 7075 somewhere down in there it's in the low end of the 7, 7 uh, 40 meter ham band in the cw portion that's a good place to land if you want to get that moved up to where you cover more of the band, most of the band, now you can cut your antenna. But if your resonant point is way up here and you want to get it down there, then you have to add to the antenna. So. Okay, there's this thing called reflected power. Some meters, such as the bird, only has reflected power. And you do that by rotating a slug. It'll give you the forward and reflected power. It's probably one of the more accurate meters that you can buy. It's probably overkill for most situations. Because I have a little meter here that I think I picked up for two or three bucks at the ham fest. And it has forward and reflected power. Not only that, it's got an adjustment here so I can set the thing and then flip back and it will give me reflected power and VSWR in one meter. Handy little thing. El Cheapo. These silly thing too are very accurate. Way up the band. I've actually used this thing to set two meter antennas and it's actually been pretty accurate. They're simple little meters. But let's talk about this for just a second. Reflected power. What is that guys? Anybody got a, anybody want to take a Take a go at that. It's the energy that doesn't leave the uh, the antenna. It's reflected back. Reflected back where? Back into your transmitter. To your transmitter. So that comes back down the line to your transmitter. Wasted energy, heat, actually. Yeah, exactly right. It's heat. It's it's wasted energy. It's heat. It's not getting out to the air. So that's the reason you want your standing wave down here and your reflected power down there. If your reflected power is zero, 100% of it's getting out. So that's efficiency. Uh, SWR 1.5 to 1. Most modern solid state radios start cutting back, I don't know, a few years ago, a 2 to 1 SWR specifically on some radios would start, they'd start cutting the power back. I think the limit's around 3 to 1 nowadays, they start cutting back. I'm not real sure. Different radios may be different things, but your solid state radio will actually cut back if it sees too much of a power loss. So, and it usually around three to one. Three to one is 25% of your power is coming back down to coax. Uh, two to one, is, it's about 12%. Yeah, of course, you get over here to not quite six to about 5.7 to one, and half of your power is coming back down your, uh, your coax. That's not what you want. You want most of your energy out. Incidentally, uh, a lot of folks, they like to buy, like to keep a chart around. Bird will sell you a chart that looks exactly like this for their meter. I think it's around 12 bucks nowadays. Or you can just print one like this. <laughs> okay. Impedances, swars, and other antenna gremlins. Here's, here's what happens to us. You made your dipole, you plotted your SWR curve, but your resonant point is three to one. I can't get it any lower than three to one. I plotted it, I've got a little dip in the band, but it won't go lower than three to one. What's happening to you? Why isn't this working? My antenna is the right length. Well, the old adage is true. Don't keep cutting your antenna length because the physics don't lie. Uh, it's the old adage, I've cut, I've cut my antenna four times and it's still too short. That's not. This is something other than your dipole. Could be several things. The feed line is radiating RF and becoming a radiating part of your antenna. That's generally what happens. There's several ways to fix this problem. It could be your, your, your close to surrounded objects. Could be materials you're using. But generally, if you've got that situation where you just can't get your standing wave down, your feed line's radiating. 
Here's a little thing about our 50 ohm radio, 75 ohm antenna, and you're going to have a reflection back. But uh, it's a mismatch in impedances. And a mismatch in impedances, specifically in coax antennas, coax fed antennas, can give you all kinds of problems. Number one, which, the one that I've always had most trouble with, again, is my feed line is radiating. It's becoming part of the antenna. So here's our two, here's our two SWR curves. Here's what we were shooting for. This is what we got. How do we fix this thing? One curve down here has a ballon. The other one is just no ballon at all, and I've just hooked it to the end, two ends of the coax, very much like this. You notice the center, your, your center conductor goes here, your braids go in here. That's pretty much what most of us do. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this balanced versus unbalanced antenna. The one to your left over here is a balanced. Being fed with 450 ohm ladder line, it's equal, symmetrical. The conductors on this side and the other side of your antenna, on both sides of your antenna, are equal. If you split this thing down the middle, it's symmetrical. Okay. You're going to take this down and you're probably going to go into a ballon. In a 450 ohm ladder line like this, you're going to go into, a, I guess, a 9 to 1. And then you're going to go from there into your shack with piece of coax. Well, after all, coax is the most popular feed line. It is very easy to use. It's very easy to get into your house. It's just a lot easier to deal with than 450 ohm or ladder line of any kind. But it's notorious for feed line radiation. Here's your coax cable and your quarter wavelength or your half wavelength antenna. So place for a ballon optional. But notice, is there anything symmetrical about feeding that with coax? Think about this for a second. Is the uh, shield exactly the same as this center conductor? Then exactly. RF like symmetry. Now we just talked about a balance. What is it? This is what a ballon is. It is a balanced to unbalanced transformer. Ballon, balanced, unbalanced. That's how they come up with that term. They can make them out of several different things. You have an air core ballon, which has no ferrite, powdered iron, if you want to call it that. This one's a ferrite toroid a ferrite rod, and you'll notice some of these things. You've seen ballons, I'm sure, at the Hamfest that look similar to these guys. Uh, this is a coaxial ballon. You don't find too many of these on HF because of how much coax it's needed to make it and how much power you, that you want to pour through it. But you'll see them used a good bit in VHF or UHF situations. You'll, you'll find that a lot of people will do that rather than try to wind a ballon for it. Any questions about a ballon? You don't happen to have a schematic drawing of that ballon, do you? I certainly do. <laughs> I have got a book full of them. Oh, it would be nice to show it up there to show how it's wound. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot of information out there on the web, and I'm going to go on. I'm going to go over information sources and where to get it. Yes. Rick, I've got, I've got a, a folded. Uh, 
Yep. Uh, it's 40 meters. Yep. And my understanding is it's, I think it's consistent with what you just instructed. Mm -hmm. That it's a 300 up. Right. So. Six to one bound. I gotta have a six, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think I got a four to one and that's probably my problem. Probably, yep. Yeah. I, mean, I think MFJ, if I remember right, I think MFJ makes a six to one balance that you can buy commercially. Okay. Or you can wind one. There's, getting into that is a whole new other learning, learning process. <laughs> but. So here it is, a naked balance. <laughs> So here's what's happening to you. A one-to-one -one ballon is an electrical device that allows balanced and unbalanced to be interfaced without disturbing the impedance arrangements of either line, okay? So it's a transformer. You can step up, step down, right? Four to one, you can make a four to one, a 200 to 50 ohm for an offset dipole. A six to one would be for a folded dipole. You can turn that folded dipole into a quad loop and that changes things too. But your unbalanced system, antenna currents on either side of the feed point are unequal. Energy spills out and flows on the outside of the coax cable. Hence, your coax cable is becoming part of your radiating element of your antenna. Well, when you do that, it kind of messes up the impedance, messes up links, messes several things up. Makes it more sensitive to surrounding objects. So, what you want your coax to look like is this. The balance will ensure that equal and opposite currents flow inside the coax cable. And remember that little animated illustration? Goes up and down many, 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 many times a second. That's, uh, that's the way you want, that, you want the, that operation to happen on the inside of this. This helps you do that. Your 50 ohm unbalanced to your 50 ohm balanced. But the pros about balance, it'll stop your feed line radiation. And the cons, balance can be expensive. I mean, there are less expensive ones, there are more expensive ones. I've got a, I think I purchased, uh, cover your ears, dear. <laughs> I, think I, I think I got a $200 balance that I use on a beam antenna. It's rated to three kilowatts, and uh, it's a toroid balance. It's a pretty expensive little device. I didn't pay that much for it. <laughs> you got a deal. I got a deal. I got a deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there an alternative to a ballon? Yes, there is. Do these work all the time? Well, most of the time. Sometimes. Maybe. <laughs> One of the most common things, and you'll see this used on beam antennas, you can use it on, on your dipole as well, is a coaxial choke. Now the thing about a coaxial choke is you want to keep the coax in a parallel shape like this. Eight inches, five to eight turns, but you want, your, you want, you want them parallel. You don't want to scrunch them up like this, you'll lose the efficiency of the, of the choke. So you want to try to do what this guy's done and he's played games with putting uh, half a dozen, or max it's probably more like a dozen cable ties in it to keep his shape. But that's what you want to do. You want to try to keep that shape. The other thing is these little guys right here, which are, you know, RF chokes. This is a this is a kit you can buy from Palomar Engineers. It's fairly expensive, but according to what um, according to what frequency you want to operate, I have used the, I have got these things off of eBay. <laughs> by a handful, they're TDK. It's, a, it's basically a, a ferrite donut. And you can put them up and down your feed line and they look like this. Now this antenna I used, I've, I've built a line of antennas about four or five years ago. I was going to Hamfest and I was selling antennas and antenna kits for beginners that I made up. And this was my demo antenna. I'd put it up, run it up a pole, let people look at it with the, with the antenna analyzer. I'm going to take these chokes off and let them look at it, because guess what this thing was doing? The feed line was radiating. Put these chokes on there and it started acting right. 
But you can get a hundred of them for twenty-six bucks or something like that. It's various prices. You can look at, look it up on eBay and find them. Look, most of them are going to come out of China, so you're going to get them in three to six weeks. God knows how long it takes. It's a slow boat, but they're cheaper that way. Uh, you'll need to get you'll need to figure out what the cutoff frequency is for them. Is there a particular diameter for that uh, coax? Yeah. Uh, coax, I forgot what the RG8, I think it's around 250 quarter inch for RG8X, RG8U, or RG11 is 450. The oh, the coil? Oh, I'm sorry. The coax coil, yeah, eight inches is what you want to shoot for. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If you can get six, that's good. RG8X pretty easily. RG8, a little tough to wind that thing on six. Eight, eight will work though. So, any other questions? Now these are different antenna matching methods. Uh, got T matches. I generally see T matches used a lot on VHF and UHF stuff. You can use it for HF. Delta match. And a gamma match. You'll find gamma matches used a lot on, on uh, basically HF beam antennas. You can make those easily. They're basically to get the right diameter of tube and take a piece of coax and cut this out. I forgot the, the exact diameter. This is around three quarters of an inch. It'll slide right in that tube, and you voila, you made your, you made a gamma match. So. Easy to do. Remember when I talked about a flat top dipole being 75 ohms? Here's what they do to match it. This is simply a quarter wave length, wavelength length of coax. The most common example is a 75 ohm. That's RG11. Uh, take it. A, you need it to be a quarter wavelength, and you're, you attach it to your dipole elements the quarter wavelength, and then down here, this, they're showing solder. You can simply use a PL259 and a bullet, <laughs> put the two together. But then it's 50 ohm any length to your shack, and your transmitter should be happy with that. One little thing about this I'd, I'll mention, uh, quarter wavelength transformers are considered high Q when it comes to in a, an electrical circuit which means their bandwidth is not going to be quite as good. So it could limit you on bandwidth a little bit. <coughs> Where I really found this a problem was when I did an odd multiple quarter wavelength transformer like this for two meters. Two meters is four megahertz wide. And I got an SWR curve that looked like that <laughs> across the band. I had four distinct humps that went up to over, went up, right up to three to one. Learned a lesson there. <laughs> yes? If, if we have a perfect 75 ohm dipole, mm -hmm. we have a perfect 50 ohm coax, mm -hmm. so what should I expect my SWR to probably be? Well, 1.3 to 1.4 to 1. Okay. And if I was 50 to 50, then I'd be 1 to 1. Mm -hmm. Is it going to hurt your transmitter? To, uh, is it going to hurt anything? No, use it. You you get it you get it down to you get it down to one point three one point four to one. Use it. Be fine. So far, I don't want to upstate Rick, but everything he's talked about is theoretical in a perfect world. We don't live in that. <laughs> and I pull nowhere near a tree or branches. We go back to the yes, sometimes maybe. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> And it's gonna it's gonna have an effect. It certainly will. Everything. What kind of what kind of ground? Speaking of ground, what kind of ground do we have here in Georgia? Anybody want to take a guess? Huh? 
Right. It is the most horrible ground in, ground in the country. Right. We right. have the it's rottenest terrible. ground. It's terrible. So right, one of these days we may do something about counter poisons and that, that'll get it that'll get interesting. Rick, Rick, what is Uh, it's one level below tr clay. <laughs> it's terrible, yeah. The interesting thing is, I'm from Long Island, surrounded by water. You would expect the ground conductivity to be pretty good. Not necessarily. That's some of the worst ground conductivity anywhere in the U.S. The best you'll get is go down to the beach, go out into the salt water, and drive your stake there. <laughs> That's a good ground. Yeah. Okay, so I've filled your head with a bunch of theoretical mumbo jumbo that. I have a hard time understanding sometimes, but you want to experiment with ham antennas and now you have questions. What kind of materials can I use? Where can I find information on antennas? What tools do I need? Do I have to have a 100 foot radio tower? Guys, the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least a couple of them. Yeah, at least two of them. That's my HOA of that. Oh, well, your HOA, just tell them it's a really tall flagpole. Yeah. And you want to be a really patriotic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the first thing you need to do, I don't care. It's like the Hunt for Red October, where I think Fred Thompson is talking to uh, Jack Ryan, and he said, Son, Russians don't go to the bathroom without a plan. <laughs> you shouldn't build an antenna without one. Seriously, if you sit down with a pencil and paper and just kind of sketch out your idea, come up with a little parts list, this is the first thing that'll save you a lot of grief. I've made my living making plans. That's what I do. And I've, I've made tons of them over the years, but we don't send anything to a customer unless we have a plan. Same thing for you guys. I mean, sit down with a pencil and paper, it doesn't have to be pretty, but it gives you, it, it starts you to thinking, gets you to planning. What do I need? Where do I, I gotta go to the store and buy something. What do I need to buy? So start with that first. Make a plan, make a parts list. And if you guys wanna if you guys decide you want to do this one, let me know. I'd like to come watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Materials. Well, I just went out and found pictures of everything because all this stuff is used. Wire. First one on the list, copper. Second one, believe it or not, your lead-in wire to, for your home power. That's aluminum. Very good conductor. Make an antenna with it. This stuff right here is for guys who don't want any stretch in their antenna or they want something very strong. I've never had an antenna that needed to be that strong. That's called copper weld. It is copper-plated steel. So it's very strong. Aluminum tubing, copper tubing, anything that conducts like that. I'm, I was notorious about, anybody had an old junk TV antenna laying around? I'd grab the thing, go home with it, get my drill out, and I'd take it apart, and I had raw material. I've made several antennas out, out of those things. You gotta think about some of these older TV antennas, the old log periodics, they cut off at 54 megahertz. What's just below that? Six meters. So. Well, I've made several antennas up of that. Insulators, glass, PVC plastic. I use a ton of PVC for about everything in the world. Center insulator, small piece of PVC, cut for a, make that, a, make that your uh, little end insulator. You don't have to go fancy, you can, Go cheap. It'll still work. Ceramic dog bone insulators. I see these as plastic. You can get them for like a buck or two a piece. These guys right here, if you're going to make a long wire antenna from your house, you can screw that into the side of the house and attach your antenna to this guy. This, I mean, these are insulators. PVC. I use a lot of it. Supports. And I'm, I'm saying this. UV stabilized rope. You can put some cordage, you, you can hang an antenna with a cotton rope. 
and about three to six months you're going to be putting it up again. Um, this is Dicron rope, very UV stable. Um, the wire man and a lot of guys sell this stuff, you can buy it online. It's, uh, it's really tough, it handles UV very well, It'll stay up a good long time. Brackets, uh, little pulleys, eyelets, anything like that. You're going to have to plan for the materials that you need to use for your own antenna system, where you want to put it. That's part of making a plan. What do I need to do? How do I need to put this antenna up? Where am I going to put it up? And then you can go through the materials. I threw this in. This wasn't in the original. But I thought this was neat. Here's a guy that sat there and not only did he wrap his own ballon, but his center insulator. I thought that, that was a very nice looking job right there. All made out of plumbing parts that you can go buy at Home Depot. Even the, uh, <coughs> even the eyelets. So you can find this stuff and you don't have to spend a lot of money making it. You can make it yourself. But I thought that was, the guy did a really neat job with that one. Yeah, well, uh, that way, that way when he, when he tells whoever his significant other is how much he spent for it, he can do one of the barcodes and say, see, this is 99 cents. <laughs> <laughs> Information sources. Books. And I consider the ARRL Antenna Handbook a must-have. It's well worth it. Get it. Keep it in your library. If, even if your library happens to be in that little room that you go sit and study for a while. It's a good, it's a good book. It covers the theory. covers how to. Different antennas you can build. But if you can't find it in here, it's going to be difficult to find it anywhere. Books are a great thing to have. I, I threw this one in because I found the picture of this book. This one is at four dollars. Guys, when I got my ham license, this was the antenna book that was published at the time I bought it. I don't want to date myself, but four bucks for a book, that was pretty darn cheap. Ain't gonna find them that cheap nowadays. But, and look, it's well worn. Even right, uh, right here is a mistake that was made when I was drilling a hole and got through the book. <laughs> Books like transmission line transformers, uh, wire antennas. This is an RSGB publication of practical wire antennas. There's even an underground dipole in this one. <laughs> How well it works, I don't know. I never thought I'd try it, but there, it's in there. This little book right here is one of many that this gentleman wrote. His name is William I. Orr, Bill Orr, W6SAI. Who ever has heard of him? I know you guys have. Bill was an engineer. He wrote the RF, or the Radio Handbook, I think, and that's a, that's a commercial publication that you know, engineers bought. Bill had a particular knack of being able to take a complex subject like antennas and make it understandable to a person like me who was an RF know nothing. So he, he's, a great, he's a great guy to read if you can get some of his books, some of his publications. He does a really good job of explaining things. And he's got great antenna designs that you can follow. But books, they're great. I, I have many in my library. The World Wide Web. Uh, this gentleman, there's one, one in particular I thought I'd mention. It's WI5EDI. This guy's an Italian ham, and he's extremely prolific. One of his, one of his very most favorite things to work on is antennas. And he has published a ton of antennas up on his site. And I've actually built some of them. They work pretty well. Uh, that's one site. The other one is something called the DX Zone. If you haven't been up there, they have links to all kinds of things. And I got a screenshot of this DX Zone. And see, where, and see right here it says antennas. They've got a whole litany of antennas that you can go look at. And, you know, there's just tons and tons and tons of information up there. YouTube, great place to go look for antennas. 
take it with a grain of salt. Some of these guys will put something up that they built and <laughs> may or may not work. You know, of course, everything everything on the web you can believe, right? But YouTube's, YouTube's a good source. I can tell you what it was a good source. I had a Mini Cooper and I needed to reset the oil life monitor. I couldn't follow, I couldn't follow those Germans. I could, just no way. I had to go to YouTube every time and then go back, run out there and reset the monitor. It's the only way I could ever do it. And one thing I think is one of the most important of all clubs, such as this one. Face it, two heads are better than one, four heads are better than two. If it's an interest, a couple of you getting together and making an antenna, chances of success are doubled because of the aggregate knowledge. Clubs are a great resource for ham radio, period. <laughs> well, it's easy to change. I can change it to whatever club I need. Yeah. <laughs> now, here's, here, here's, here's our favorite thing. Tools. <laughs> tools and more tools. What do you need to make an antenna with? Well, first thing, something we all probably have is basic hand tools. Some sort of a drill. Good, a good pair of wire strippers. I can't. <laughs> I meant to bring the. I have. I have an eight inch, eight inch, eight inch floppies. Yeah, I meant to bring I love them. The eight inch yeah. <laughs> I'm careful we date ourselves when we talk about eight inch floppies. <laughs> I, I can do that. You should not do that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but a good pair of wire strippers. Uh, it's, uh, go ahead and go ahead and get a decent set. These are channel locks that I've got. They're good. They're, it's a good pair. The cheaper ones are, tend to be a little flimsy, but. Get a good pair. Uh, soldering. Soldering gun and uh, solder. Basically, I have solder at a decent size. Picked this up at a ham fest for 10, 15 bucks. I think this is probably 50 thou or bigger. bigger. Solder flux. This is very handy when you're trying to, trying to get solder to coat something with. And I can tell you from experience that for antennas, you're not going to solder wires like this with a 30 watt soldering gun. Anybody knows that, you're going to find out that that just makes a mess. It just didn't get hot enough. This particular gun, you can find them used. You can pick you up a new one. It's a Weller. It, it has two stages. It's 100 watt and 140 watt. Soldering PL259s and soldering antennas together, this thing is well worth its money. Use it for, you can use it for crafts too, it's not just a soldering tool. An SWR meter. As, I've, as I've alluded, this is a reflected power. Used to be, used to be said that if the FCC came to your station to check it, this is what they would check it with, and it's about five percent accurate. You know, these things operate with slugs. That's what that's what makes them all operate. And it's simple. You've got your antenna one way and your transmitter the other. To find out your forward and reflected power, just rotate it, and that's how that's how it tells you. You can get slugs for this thing up to what? Is it 50,000 or no, it's not 50. You can get slugs up to 10,000 watts with this thing, I think. Yeah. This little guy right here, if you're not doing much more than 100 watts, uh, you know, you may fry it, but you may not. These little guys are available for nothing. And it's, it's a good tool to have. The one up there, I think, is an MFJ version, and it's got peak, peak and... Uh, so have peak and average power. It's got power output. It goes up to three kilowatts. Uh, it's a nice one to have. Uh, one thing I mentioned up there is antenna modeling software. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Uh, you can go to the DX Zone, and I think you can download both of these. One of them is EasyNIC, and that's a stripped-down version of a commercial software package for antenna engineers. They actually model antennas with it. I think the 
commercial package is you know a few thousand dollars where this one basically is kind of like it's freeware you can go download it and I think you may be able to donate to it I don't remember uh, the other one is this I can't even pronounce it, Immanigal or whatever it is. This guy's written by some uh, engineers over in Europe. And it's, it's got a little bit more fe a little more features attached to it than the Easy Neck does. And I think this one is a little bit easier to, uh, a little more user friendly to model your antenna. Uh, I don't know if anybody's had any experience with either one of these or not, but uh, you can get that, use it, and give you some predictions on whatever kind of antenna you want to use. It's a, it's a nice little tool to have, and since they're freeware or shareware, it's not not cost not just totally uncost effective for you to get. Last thing I want to mention, and this is a nice to have too, is an antenna analyzer. Now this thing will do several functions. The main function is you can sweep your antenna, find out where it's resonant. You can get the impedance of the antenna. It'll give you a direct read and tell you all sorts of information about your antenna. It also will tell you if your coax has a short and where it's shorted at. It'll tell you your loss in coax. Also, if you've got a ballon that you don't know what it is, You can put a carbon resistor, do not use a wire wound, but put a carbon resistor across it. These little balance I bought for a QRP project, kind of like a backpacking type project. But you can then measure that using this and it will tell you you can find your impedance of the ballon. You can also sweep it to see what its, its bandwidth is. Very handy for that sort of thing. In fact, this slide is an excerpt out of the MFJ259 manual on how they do it. You can actually go to YouTube and you can watch Martin Jew, who is the owner himself, step you through how to, how to use this for several different things. And one of them is that ballon. You know, it's nice to go to ham fest and there's a ballon laying there, a little worn. You, you don't know what it is, neither does the guy, and you give him a dollar for it. Well, you might have just saved yourself 50 bucks there. <coughs> if it's good. You know, well, this is a way to find out. They're handy for great things. If you play with antennas a lot, and you end up buying one of these, you're going to ask yourself the same question I did. Why did I buy this years ago? So, really, it's a very handy tool. Several companies make them at various levels of expense, and I, I use this one. How many people have one of these guys? Oh, got a bunch of folks. Good. <laughs> handy tool. Well worth the money. Do you need the expensive tower steel bow rays? Do you need a store-bought antenna? No, you don't really need it. <laughs> you can make a respectable signal without that. Over to your left here, you've got antennas and trees. This one looks more or less like a vertical dipole, which you can do that with. You know, here's a dipole that's kind of through the through the trees there, I don't know any of you guys that have. Uh, I got a I got a story that I'll tell a little bit. If any of you guys that have uh, restrictions and you have trees, you know, I've I've hidden a few antennas in those. Uh, you can put it in your attic. This enterprising gentleman, our, our lady has. Uh, they have a antenna switch and two different dipoles, so they're covering a couple of bands up there in their attic. How long you do I know? Yeah, if you got a metal roof, you're in trouble. <laughs> that, tends, that tends to mean you've got the top portion of a Faraday cage, and a Faraday cage blocks all RF. But now, you can attach to that roof and use it as your radiating element. This guy's rather enterprising. Yeah, yes, sir. I'm just curious. Uh, I haven't really tried this, but you have a couple of them strung in your attic. Do they couple with each other? Can. 
keep them away, change the angles. Take them perpendicular to each other or something? Perpendicular or some sort of an angle to try to keep a difference in, the, in, the, in height. If you have them right next to one another, think about a beam antenna. A beam antenna basically has a driven element that's at the frequency you want to operate. It has a reflector, which is a 5% longer, and that interacts with this antenna and causes your energy to go out forward. And you got directors, which also direct it and pull your, and pull your energy into a, you know, an angular, almost like a flashlight. So, yes, they can interact. And the way to, way to stop that as best you can is to change heights, change angles. And, that's, and you'll just have to try it if you, get, if you run into that situation. Yep. It's uh, radio waves brand. Okay. And it has a uh, 40, 20, 10, and 6. And yeah. Ten on it. Single, uh, so, so one to one uh, ballon mm -hmm. and uh, coax connection. Right. How does it work for you? How does it work for you? Oh, with the uh, three at the top, three is <coughs> great. The, uh, it's only like 18 feet high if it's in the attic. And, and it's, I, it's what you can get. That's right. <laughs> I have used uh, rotor wire, the flat cable. I've cut dipoles out of that, where, you know, start with 40, 20, 15, 10. And those things are right next to one another. And uh, I don't seem to have problems with those. So, but yes, exactly right. And those are parallel. They're not fanned out, so to speak, but they're parallel. And that works. I mean, there's, there's examples in these books of those type of antennas. This guy, I threw it in because basically it looks like the top three antennas are probably purchased. This one on the bottom here looks like a homemade six meter antenna, and I think that is a rectangular or a square tube, which you'll find on a lot of old TV antennas. So it looks like the guy made him, and he's got that mounted in his attic and got enough space to rotate it, which is pretty nice. This one I threw in, I don't think it's gonna make your hummingbirds happy. <laughs> But, yeah, you see that you got a wire attached. So you can radiate the birds. Maybe they'll glow a little bit more. I don't know. Okay, I want to talk about figure one, stealth antennas. You can do several things. I don't know if you guys like, you guys like this one? This was a good one. I like the figure. You like the figure? Something wrong with it? <laughs> Exactly right. That's exactly what you want. <laughs> you want your homeowners association to see that. Yeah. Outdoor in trees, use colors to hide your wires. You can make a temporary structure. You could take it out in evenings or night. Take it back in so when the homeowners association comes rushing up there to see what you're doing, you say, "What in done?" You know that's. The, that's one way to handle it. Hide it as part of your home or building instructions you saw on this previous slide. Gutters are mostly made of aluminum, and that's a good, that is a, that is a good uh, conductor. You hide it in the attic or other interior spaces. But I've got something in red here, and I want you to pay particular attention to it. However, pay close attention to SEC RF exposure guidelines. Please, that's ionizing radiation. You wouldn't want to open the door of a microwave oven and sit there and watch it. I mean, there's, there's stories that I've heard of, of radio, of, of radar uh, repair guys working for the government that used to warm their lunch in, in, the, in the field of some of those radar systems. That's what's happening to you. So FCC, there are plenty of places where you can go calculate this. Please do. When you do one of these installations in your home that you're going to be close proximity to it, please do. Understand how much RF you can stand. 
Here's a list. Here's some unusual antennas. If you want to try to hide them. I like that bottom <laughs> <laughs> This particular antenna right here is a Hustler 5BTV. It's in a PVC pipe. Down here you can see the ring out in the front yard. It's a perfect flag flagpole. If you're allowed a flagpole, you got it made. Turnstile antenna looks like a bird feeder to me. Going into your, uh, we're going into your uh, uh, gutters right there. Uh, run a fence line. A lot of people have fences. Um, and then this one, my favorite. And in fact, I saw some aluminum crutches at uh, mm -hmm. at, uh, at Goodwill. And this guy turned them into. Apparently, he didn't need crutches anymore. At least until he told his wife how much he spent on that antenna that she wasn't too happy about. <laughs> A word or two about antenna tuners. They will help you extend your bandwidth. They will help you do many things with your antenna. Uh, you know, automatic antenna tuner, I actually own these two. These guys will tune a coat hanger. But I wanna say, I wanna caution you, it will tune a coat hanger, but a coat hanger is going to radiate like a coat hanger. These things will extend your bandwidth, let you cover more of the bands, but they will not make up for a poorly designed antenna. So keep that in mind when using an antenna tuner. They're, well, they're, they're, they're worthwhile, but... I really wish they would start teaching that an antenna tuner is not an antenna tuner. <laughs> it is an impedance matching, matching device. device. There is not a thing on this earth that will tune your antenna. It just simply changes the impedance. You tune, you tune your antenna by making sure it's resonant. Yeah, wire <laughs> And what if you make a mistake? Well, I hope you do. I hope you make another, and then another. Because making mistakes is proof we learn and grow. Henry Ford probably said that best when he said the only real mistake is from one we, which we learn nothing. And... Uh, well, Henry made several of them. One of them is the Phillips head screw, which we can thank him for, which I hate when I round them out, but that's neither here nor there. But you're gonna make mistakes. Don't worry about it. There's all kinds of resources to help figure it out. Thank you. Hope it didn't bore you too much. Not at all.